my name is Abdullah Al-Asad and I'm a medical student at King Saud bin Abdelaziz University of Health Sciences. And today is going to be our first video about GI physiology, in particular about control and motility. So without further ado, let's get started. Here's the outline of what we're going to talk about today. So we're going to start with the neural control, then we're going to jump into the endocrine control, and after that we're going to talk about motility in details of each part of our GI tract. Now, first thing we want to talk about is the electrical activity of GI smooth muscles. And basically it states that our smooth muscles in our GI tract basically work in a rhythm, okay? So they move in a certain rhythm. Now this rhythm changes from one part to another, but this rhythm is based, uh, is you know, best categorized as slow wave, okay? Or described as slow wave, okay? And this movement happens uh, with actions of depolarization and repolarization. Depolarization happens from influx of calcium and repolarization from efflux of potassium. Okay, now this might look like action potential, but it's not really action potential. And all this, this slow wave or this rhythm is done by the interstitial cells of Kajal. Now these cells are basically cells that act like pacemakers in our GI tract. And if you take them and look, look at them under a microscope, they actually look like uh, pacemaker cells in our heart. Okay, now jumping into the neural control, we have intrinsic system and extrinsic system. The intrinsic system is basically we have two plexuses in our uh, in our uh, GI cells. Uh, the first plexus is the Meissner plexus or the Meiner's plexus, and this plexus is very important in regulating our GI secretions. Okay, and this plexus is is found in the submucosa layer. Okay, the second plexus is basically the orbax plexus, and this plexus is found between the two layers of the muscularis externa, so between the circular layer and the longitudinal layer, and this is very important for movement and peristalsis. Okay, now jumping to the external system, so over here in this slide we have the external system, so we have sympathetic and parasympathetic system. Now, in, our, in the sympathetic system, when it's activated, we have decreased motility, we have decreased secretions, and we have increase in constriction of sphincters. So basically, when we're in fight or flight mode, there's no, no, no sort of digestion going on. As for the parasympathetic system, we have increased motility through acetylcholine, okay? And we have increased secretions through also acetylcholine, okay? Now, uh, parasympathetic system also uh, affects the two plexuses that we just mentioned, the Meissner plexus, which gives us secretions, and the Orbach plexus, which gives us motility. Okay, And also, it will decrease the constriction of sphincters by, by a transmitter called VIP. Okay, This is what we call a vasoactive intestin uh, intestinal peptide. Okay, And this usually works on sphincters by relaxing them. And we... Uh, it's an inhibitory peptide, and when we say inhibitory, it means that instead of uh, contraction of the muscle, it, the muscle starts to relax, okay? And we also have increased secretion of gastrin, which is a hormone that we'll, we'll talk about in the next slide, through GRP, which is gastrin-releasing peptide. So here are the hormonal control in our GI tract. So let's start one by one. Now, our first her hormone is secretin. Okay, now secretin is, uh, the source is from the duodenum, the S cells in the duodenum. And what happens, uh, what stimulates secretin is basically acid. So what happens is that once the chyme or the content of the stomach leaves the stomach and enters the duodenum, the content of the stomach is basically acidic. Okay, and duodenum can't handle much acid as, uh, as the stomach. So once the acid enters the duodenum, it will stimulate or it will tell the S cells to secrete Secretin, okay, and this secretin will do what? It will basically tell the pancreas to give us bicarbonate, so it can buffer the acid, and also to, will tell the stomach to stop stop moving and secretions, uh, stop secreting uh, any kind of secretions. So it it will it will prevent or inhibit stomach motility. It will basically tell the stomach, hold up, let me let me t take care or handle what I have in the duodenum right now. Our second hormone is basically cholecystokinin, or CCK in, in short. It also comes from the ice. It comes from the eye cells of the duodenum. Okay, and what stimulates this is basically fat or amino acids, but usually mostly fat. Okay, so what happens is the content of the stomach leaves the stomach and enters the duodenum. If that content has fat, okay, it will tell the eye cells to secrete cholecystokinin. 
Okay, and what will cholecystokinin do? It will basically tell the stomach, it will inhibit stomach motility and secretion, just like the secretin, okay? And it will tell the pancreas to give us all of its secretions, like lipase and colipase, for digest, di digesting the food that just came in. And also the gallbladder will con contract and give us all of its content, okay? Which is very important, also digesting fat and food. And also it will tell the sphincter of Adi to relax so that the gallbladder content can reach the duodenum. Okay. Now, a very important point about CCK is that it's the most important for regulation of pancreatic secretions. Okay. Now, the next hormone we have is gastrin, which we talked about a little, which we mentioned in the uh, previous slide. It comes from the G cells of the stomach. Okay. So not this time it's not the duodenum; it's the stomach. Okay. Now, what stimulates uh, gastrin release? Uh, well, basically, we have the stomach distension. Well, basically, when food enters the stomach, it will make this it will distend the stomach. That will give us gastrin, GRP through the vagus nerve, and also proteins. Okay, all these will stimulate gastrin. Will basically stimulate the stomach motility and secretions. Okay, and also uh, another thing that uh, gastrin is very unique in some points, where it is the only hormone that has. Neural control through the vagus uh, through the vagus nerve that gives us GRP, which is gastrin releasing peptide, and it's the only one that gives us feedback inhibition, because basically what gastrin does is that through gastrin it will stimulate more uh, a cascade of uh, of actions that will decrease the pH of the stomach. So we're going to secrete more acid in the stomach, basically. Okay, and once the uh, once the pH goes down the pH will give us a negative feedback to the gastrin. Okay, so it's the only hormone that has negative feedback. Our last hormone here is basically GIP, okay, which is a hormone found in the duodenum, okay, the cases of the duodenum. What stimulates it uh, is fat, carbohydrates, and amino acids. So basically food in general, but mostly carbohydrates, okay, and it will also tell the Stomach motility, it will inhibit the stomach motility and secretions, okay? And last but not least, it will tell the, the pancreas to secrete insulin. Now, what you see here, all of these hormones that we just mentioned, secretin, cholecystokinin, gastrin, and GIP, they all stimulate insulin. However, GIP is the most important one. And that's why some, some questions or some exams will ask the question, what is more, what's more better to raise insulin in our body? Oral sugar or IV, okay? And the answer is actually oral because in, uh, because once we take sugar through our oral route, we'll, we will stimulate the GIP, which will stimulate insulin. So here we have the GI functional motility. So we have three functions that our GI tract usually does, okay? So storage, okay? Segmentation or mixing, mixing is much easier, and peristalsis, okay? Now, what you need to know about this one is that mixing is done by the circular layer in our muscularis externa. We, we all know in our, in our GI tract we have two kinds of um, muscular layer. We have circular and longitudinal. So the mixing will happen through the circular layer and the propulsive or the peristalsis will happen through the longitudinal layer. And we also we, we mentioned before that peristalsis is also controlled by the orbax plexus. Now over here just is, is a, basically a general idea of each part of our GI tract and what does it do. So when we talk about our esophagus, basically only peristalsis, so only movement. When we talk about the stomach, we have peristalsis, we have mixing, and we have storage. When we talk about the small intestines, there's no storage, only mixing and peristalsis. And last but not least, the colon or the large intestine, we have storage, Okay, we have mixing and we have also peristalsis. So it's very important to know each part, what does it do. Now let's talk about the esophagus in detail. Okay, so first thing you need to know about the esophagus is that it has two sphincters, the upper esophageal sphincter and the lower esophageal sphincter. Okay, now what happens is once we have, once food reaches down to the esophagus, we're going to have first of all, swallowing mechanism, which is which happens through cranial nerves 9 and 10, okay? So once we have swallowing, we, we're going to have something called the primary 
peristaltic wave, okay? Which basically uh, means that the, uh, the, the food will start to move down through, to the esophagus until it reaches the lower esophageal sphincter. Now, once it reaches the lower esophageal sphincter, the, the lower esophageal sphincter will relax through peptide VIP. Remember VIP, which is vasoactive inhibitory peptide, which we said that usually works on sphincters and relaxes the muscle. So the lower esophageal sphincter will then relax and then the food will reach the stomach. Also, another thing important thing to know, that once we have the swallowing mechanism, the vagus nerve will go on to the, mus to the stomach and will tell the stomach, hey, you're about to, you're about to receive some food. Relax. You have to relax your muscles so you can re receive all that food. This is what we call receptive relaxation, which basically is a reflux that causes the muscle to relax, and it's triggered by swallowing through the vagus nerve. Okay? Now, let's say that the upper esophageal sphincter does not give us the primary peristaltic wave, or swallowing, uh, we said swallowing gives us a primary peristaltic wave. Let's say that that doesn't happen for some reason. What goes on? We have something called the secondary peristaltic wave, which basically states that, let's say this is the muscle of the esophagus, and it's distended over here because there's food, okay? Let's say here there's, there's food going on over here, okay? So once we have distension, as you can see, the muscle over here is distended, okay? The, the, uh, the esophagus or the muscles in, in our GI tract react to this distension by what? By contraction. Okay, so then it will start to contract, okay, pushing the food forward. Okay, this is what we call the secondary peristaltic wave. This only happens in case the primary does not work. So, here are some pathologies when we talk about the esophagus. So, we have something called achalasia, which basically says that once the food reaches the lower esophageal sphincter, normally you would expect that the lower esophageal sphincter would relax, so it can allow the food to reach the stomach. If it doesn't relax, this will cause achalasia, and the food will get stuck in the esophagus. Okay? We have reflux esophagitis, or gastroesophageal reflux, which basically says that, in general, when we're not eating, the lower esophageal sphincter should be constricted because we don't want the stomach content to reach the esophagus. Now, if it doesn't constrict very well, some of the stomach content, which is acidic, might reach the esophagus and might damage the, esoph uh, the esophagus wall. So, that could, the, so we have a risk of erosions, okay? That's in case of reflux esophagitis, because the lower esophageal sphincter is not closing up very well. We have diffuse esophageal spasm, which basically says that our muscles in our esophagus are basically contracting by itself, okay? And this might cause a very uh, severe chest pain that could actually mimic a heart attack, okay? So, it might, so the symptoms might look like a heart attack, okay? And if, you do some, and if you do a barium swallowing test, you would actually see that there is spontaneous contractions in our esophagus. Last pathology, we have swallowing difficulties, and this is, you can, you can categorize this into two ways. If we have problems uh, with swallowing solids, okay, this usually tells us it's mostly a mechanical problem, okay? And sometimes we have difficulties in initiating swallowing, okay? So we can't, swa we can't begin swallowing, okay? This usually tells us it's a, it's a neural problem. Just like, for example, if someone has a patient, a stroke patient, and he damaged the nuclei of cranial nerves 9 and 10, which are which control swallowing, okay? Now let's jump into the stomach, okay? Now in the stomach, we have, we said, uh, we have a basic electrical rhythm. Remember the basic electrical rhythm? And the stomach it basically is 3 per minute, okay? That's uh, how many times, uh, or the rhythm in our stomach movement, okay? Now what causes or what increases or stimulates stomach movement, okay? Well, first thing we have is distension, okay, of the, uh, of the, of the stomach. That happens when, when the food reaches the stomach and distends the, the muscle wall. We have gastrin hormone, which we mentioned. And we have the parasympathetic from the vagus nerve, okay? Which, which also can increase the, uh, the muscle or the stomach movement. Now, what inhibits the stomach movement? Well, we said the duodenum has a lot of hormones that can inhibit the stomach movement. We have CCK, we mentioned. We have secretin also. Yeah. Uh, we have 
the stomach distension. Now, the stomach, for example, uh, or the, sorry, the duodenum distension. Now, the duodenum re has, uh, has content inside it, okay, and the muscles get distended. It will tell the stomach to stop. Uh, it will decrease inhibit stomach motility because it needs to deal or handle of handle the food it has inside it. Okay, and also uh, the osmolarity of the duodenum. If it increases, it can also inhibit the stomach contraction. Okay, and also we have pH. If the pH goes down, as we said, if the pH goes goes down this can give a negative feedback on gastrin okay and gastrin as you as we know is stimulates the stomach motility okay so p low ph can also inhibit stomach motility now let's talk about uh, mot uh, the content of the stomach okay now the content of the stomach also affects motility okay so some some foods pass through the stomach faster than others okay the fastest thing is basically when we have when we eat content that is isotonic okay so isotonic is the best one to pass through the stomach and the worst kind of food that can pass through the stomach is basically fat okay as because also fat when it reaches the duodenum it will start to secrete costakinin which prevents the stomach and when you said isotonic is the fastest one that's why athletes drink Gatorade because the Gatorade is also isotonic which can uh, pass through the stomach quickly and uh, absorption also happens quickly okay and now uh, just a little bit of a clinical part in uh, talking about the stomach sometimes over here in the vagus nerve when we have patients with diabetes okay patients with diabetes can come with diabetic neuropathy okay and if that diabetic neuropathy affects the vagus nerve now, what will that cause? It will cause basically bloating and constipation. Bloating because the stomach motility has decreased because the vagus nerve is not working, so the stomach will, will be will distended, okay? And constipation because motility in general is being decreased because parasympathetic is not working. Now, let's jump here to the small intestine. We have two kinds of movement, segmentation contraction or this is responsible for mixing, okay? And peristaltic wave, this is for responsible for pushing the <clears throat> the content forward okay now we also mentioned that the segmentation contraction is done by the circular layer in our in our, in our muscularis externa and the peristaltic wave is done by the longitudinal layer now here the basic electrical rhythm in the small intestine is faster than the stomach it's 12 per minute okay and as the, just like in the stomach parasympathetic increases the small intestine movement but the sympathetic decreases and the peristaltic wave will keep on pushing the content forward until it reaches the ileocecal valve okay which is the valve that or or sphincter that uh, connects the ileum which is the last part of the small intestine with the cecum which is the first part of the large intestine okay now this this uh, sphincter is basically uh, it opens or closes based on the pressure. Okay, so let's say here is the sphincter. Now, if we have increase in the ileum, increased pressure in the ileum, the sphincter will relax, okay, so that the content will move forward. But we, if we have increased pressure in the cecum, okay, the sphincter will shut, will close, will constrict, okay, so that no more content can move forward. Okay, now in colon, we have exact, we have some, uh, the same movement as we have in the small intestine. So we have segmentation contraction, okay, which is responsible for mixing. But in the colon, through the segmentation contraction, or one, once that happens, we're going to find things like bubbles, as you can see here, which we call haustrations, okay. That's we're going to find that only in the colon. And also, we have the peristaltic movement, or what we call it in the, in the colon, mass movement. This term is very important. So when you hear the word mass movement, remember, you're talking about the large intestine or the colon. Now, let's go to the final part, which is defecation. Okay. Now, once the content reaches to the rectum and eventually to the anus, we have two sphincters that regulate the defecation. We have the internal anal sphincter, and we have the external anal sphincter now the internal anal sphincter is smooth muscle okay so it's controlled by sympathetic and parasympathetic okay now sympathetic through the lumbar splanchnic nerves and the parasympathetic through the pelvic splanchnic nerves okay as for the external anal sphincter it is a skeletal muscle 
So it is regulated, okay, by inferior rectal branch of the pudendal nerve, okay, and this is and it gets it it's relaxed during defecation. On to the last part, which is the migrating myoelectric complex, or in short, MMC. This basically is, or to describe this, is basically a movement of our entire GI tract once we uh, there is a situation of fasting, or there's no, no food, okay? So, very important to know, fasting, okay, once there's fasting. Why do we have this? Basically, it's a cleaning system. So, anything that's left behind gets cleaned up okay it gets repeated every 90 to 120 minutes okay and it's correlated also with high levels of motilin which is a hormone okay and not only does it a cleaning system but it only prevent it also prevents a backflow of bacteria okay from colon to ileum because if the bacteria in the colon reaches the ileum it might uh, you know stay there and live there for a long time and even causes infections okay so the migrating myoelectric complex what you need to know points is that happens during fasting the hormone involved is motilin okay the function it's a cleaning system and prevents backflow of bacteria these are the references i used in this video thank you very much for watching if you have any comments or questions don't hesitate to contact us through this email address thank you very much and have a nice day